Hello, everybody, and welcome to day two of Par Dreaming. I am Christina Mugulis, joining you from Circonde. I'm here to introduce you to your presenters, Julian and Evo, who are going to be giving a presentation on Salesforce campaigns. I'm going to kick it over to them now. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Christina. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Greetings from Madrid, Spain. Uh, we are uh, Julian and Nico and Evo, and uh, we are part of Ibiquo. Uh, we are a marketing operations uh, consultancy, uh, which is focused on connecting the marketing strategy with the business uh, results. Uh, and uh, today we want to present to you the strategy behind the tool. Uh, so how to implement uh, the, mar the Salesforce campaigns. So what we are going to do is to share with you the six tips for this uh, successful implementation of these uh, Salesforce campaigns. So when we start talking about uh, Salesforce campaigns or hearing about Salesforce campaign, we can feel a little bit overwhelmed, right? We, we start like uh, getting a little bit crazy and that is uh, normal uh, because what happens uh, normally is when we start talking about Salesforce campaign, there are so many things going on, connected campaigns, attribution model, engagement dashboard, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it can be a little, a lot of things to implement and we don't know where to start. So that's why we are here because we want to share to you uh, our what uh, we normally do in the process to implement the Salesforce uh, campaigns and to share with you the six tips uh, that uh, will help you on this the successful implementation of the of the campaigns. So let's start with uh, tip number one. Uh, the first thing is to spend more time on planning. A lot of time what happens uh, when we start a project uh, with uh, different customers is that we see that the teams spend a lot of time on reporting, building very nice graphs uh, uh, and, and looking to, to create these uh, really nice reports, uh, putting the metrics in the Salesforce dashboard, et cetera, et cetera. But what happens is that they don't take a lot of time on campaign structure and defining and talking to the different stakeholders to define what they want to measure and how they want to measure it. Also, another important thing is that uh, normally what happens is that they don't know exactly how to track all the touch points that they, the leads have or the contacts have with the marketing campaigns. So what it, that gives at the end is a lack of alignment between the stakeholders. Some people are looking to measure one thing, so others are expecting other things. Also, uh, there are some touch points which are not tracked. So that uh, give us uh, the, some loose on the information. So we don't get at the end, the good reporting that we are looking for. So our first tip, uh, very basic, but very important one is to take more time in defining what is the right structure of your campaigns to talk to your uh, different stakeholders and uh, work on how to implement this in Salesforce, and then to define how you're going to track uh, the different uh, touch points that your leads have with your marketing campaigns. And that will give you a good reporting. So for talking about the campaign structure, I let my colleague Julian to talk about the second tip. Thanks, Ivo. So yes, we focus tip two on Looking, at, looking together on how to build the, the right campaign structure. And first of all, it is uh, all about aligning stakeholders on the definitions. Uh, indeed, when we start working on a uh, campaign structure project, we often see this kind of uh, organization where people or the teams are organizing their campaigns uh, with parent campaigns to keep track of the period of time the campaign is on, all the different channel and conversion point and so on and so forth relying a lot of parent, on parent campaigns and parent naming to be able to, re, to find out uh, what's happening in, in their strategy, right? The thing is, when you're doing that, at some point, you're mixing up a bit uh, different concepts, which are channel, conversion points, or even umbrella campaigns, right? So let's take an example. Uh, let's say you're launching a webinar, right? So you will have uh, different channels on which you will distribute your webinar campaigns might be an email campaign or LinkedIn ads. So those two are a channel. Uh, and then you will have a webinar landing page where your user will end up to, to sign up for this webinar. This is a conversion point. And the, the whole stuff can be uh, grouped into a kind of umbrella campaign uh, to, to regroup all the, all the, um, the performance no? of, the, of, this, of this webinar campaign. So the issue here is that as I said, we cannot, we cannot compare 
uh, channels and conversion point and umbrella campaign performances because they're not the same. They're not the same concepts. So here it's super important to start with and a and basically align your stakeholders on what it is that you want to track and what it is that you want to track against your business revenue and your uh, costs. Okay. Once you've got that right, then uh, I will share with you some tips or hints that you we usually use to implement this structure properly in uh, in Salesforce. So first one is using recall type on your campaign object to separate uh, layouts on the different uh, 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 concepts, right? If you're tracking marketing channel, you might want to have some information on the channel. When you're tracking the conversion point, you might want to have some other stuff, uh, other sort of information. So this is where you're going to separate a bit the two concepts and the, the information you're gathering there. For that, we usually, we usually use uh, custom fields. So for instance, if we are talking about channels, we will use custom fields to properly track the channel, for instance, paid, or what we could say the sub-channel, we could be AdWords or Facebook or LinkedIn ads. And then the countries uh, that are issuing those campaigns or the goal or, or whatever you want to uh, qualify your campaign uh, on. And this will be super useful for you at the end to be able to filter your reports, filter your dashboards uh, on, on, on those information and group your campaigns, not only re relying on the naming, uh, which can be uh, subject to human errors and, and this kind of stuff, right? Uh, on the same page, uh, I would strongly recommend not relying on parent campaigns or naming to uh, classify or to organize your campaigns on time period like flagging them by q3 or or, or by month or whatever but instead of that properly use this start and end date that you've got available natively on the campaign object because this will enable you then afterwards to uh, filter on your report on the period you want to analyze so super important to use it uh, it's uh, often overlooked and it's a pity i would say <laughs> A, and finally, in our case, we often recommend to use parent campaigns to properly group the different actions. So if we're talking about channels here, uh, group the different channels you will use to distribute your uh, main campaigns. Uh, so for instance, in our webinar example, we will group our email, paid, uh, Facebook campaign, and LinkedIn organic, let's say, uh, all those three channels under the same parent campaign so we can gather and group all the performance of my actions, my global action and under the same one, right? So basically we will go from a uh, not that actionable and, uh, and scalable structure to a real proper campaign database that you will be able to use and query uh, how, whatever you, however you want uh, from, from the different sources, right? So now that we're clear on the data structure, Let's see how to push your leads or contacts to those campaigns. Okay, we all know this. I won't spend too, too much time on that one. We all use Pardot, so we all know the automation rules, engagement studio, completion action, and so on and so forth to, to push our, our user to the campaigns. But what we're going to share with you today is um, uh, a thing that we, we, we implement in general on recalled, uh, sorry, yeah, recall triggered flows in Salesforce. These techniques will enable you to push automatically your leads and contacts into the campaign without having to uh, to run a new automation rule or a new completion action each time you're running a campaign. So it's a way to save a lot of time on your marketing operation team uh, and they will love you. <laughs> so let's start. Okay, let's say that we all know this, right? The UTM, source, medium, content, uh, things that we will append to our, our URL to track our campaigns, right? So the only thing that we will need to do is at the time we create our Salesforce campaign, we will retrieve the ID of this campaign in the URL, or well, always starting with 701, all right? And we will append this ID in a new parameter on our uh, links. So uh, here I call the parameter Salesforce campaign ID, SFC ID, you can call it whatever you like. Okay, so here we've got the three IDs for our three campaigns for our webinar. 
let's say our user click on our email it will land on our website and along working along with your it team you will be able to um, collect this id in your parameter and store it into your cookies so that your user can navigate your website see your product page blogs etc and at the moment you will decide to fill out a form then you will be able to capture this id in a hidden field uh, of your form and pass this information to pardot and ends to Salesforce, to the lead or the contact object. And so you can know on your Salesforce object the, the campaign your user came from. All right. So now uh, the last stuff, not, not the least one, uh, the idea is to build this flow that will look at this campaign ID, at your lead ID or your contact ID. I will say, OK, is this lead already in this campaign? If the answer is no, then you will push and create the campaign member. If the answer is yes, then you will only update your campaign member to update the, the for instance, the, mem the campaign member status. OK, and you're done. You don't need to create any more automation rule or, or anything. Uh, your lead will directly go into the campaigns each time they will fill out the form. And this is your marketing operation team. <laughs> All right. So next is next tip, tip four is uh, beyond the trackable. So what if I can't have control over the URL and the parameters? So yes, this we know how to do it. We've just talked about it. But what about SEO, social media, referral, stuff like that, where people coming to our website and we don't have control over those parameters, over those UTM or, or whatsoever? Well, here is the trick. Uh, I don't know if you already know, but every single website has like a little box uh, called document referrer where there is this information stored. So this information is the URL where your user is coming from uh, before landing to your website. So imagine here I will click on LinkedIn. This is a non-tracked uh, link, okay? Uh, so I will I will click on LinkedIn and land on, on the website. Here you will be you will see that on the document refer uh, information document, you have the source where I come from, LinkedIn.com. And then, well, the process is more or less the same, so I will go quicker. But basically, we will store this information in the cookie, and uh, you will pass it through a hidden field in your forms to send this information to Pardot and Salesforce. And here, the same way you did with the ID, you will look like the, the, the formula will be something like, uh, if there is no ID I've been able to retrieve, uh, but I do have a URL in my referrer, then I can associate my lead or my contact to the organic campaign uh, uh, corresponding to this URL. So for instance, if the guy is coming from google.com, I know, and I don't have any other UTM, I know it is SEO coming from Google. So you can then retrieve SEO Google, SEO Yahoo, SEO Yandex, whatever, and the same for your social media and so on and so forth, as, as, as long as you associate your URL with your campaigns and your tracked. So instead of having a big, campaign like a big bucket about unknown source or direct traffic that we all hate. Now you've got a bit more of a granularity and information on your organic channels. All right. So next tips, I will let Ivo talk to you about the member statuses and this important uh, information. Thanks, Julian. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about uh, tip number five. So basically, we have seen, OK, we know already how to track and how to add automatically the leads or the contacts to the different campaigns. So we have all the touch points uh, associated to different campaigns. So now the question is how we build the campaign influence report. So we know that one, uh, one recommended step uh, that we need to put uh, in place when building the campaign influence is to uh, exclude or to include only the users who are in responded status in the uh, campaign influence, right? In the auto association rules of the campaign influence. So here it will come the question of what is responded. So here, um, 
The answer is not simple. And basically the answer is it depends. It depends because in several teams, it can mean different things. Uh, so for example, if we come back to the campaign when we have the, the webinar and we are launching an email to promote this webinar, for some teams, uh, the, the responded status could start from the moment the user click on the email and then we set the status as responded in this, in this case. For other teams, it could be only from the moment the, the user submit a form and register to the webinar. And for others, maybe more strict, they will only consider the responded status uh, as uh, when the user, in fact, attend to the webinar or watch uh, the recording of the of the webinar, right? So it uh, again, it depends. It's not there's no good or bad answer. It depends a lot on the way your company and your team uh, de decide the campaign influence should be taken into account. The most important thing is to to have an agreement with your st your stakeholders because in this way you are going to have the right reporting and you are going to have a a, a reporting with that everybody agrees on. And when you have this uh, definition in place, our suggestion is to do a plan a plan that uh, will collect all your campaigns, as in the example that you see on the screen, uh, are the campaigns uh, focused on the different channels. And for each channel, I'm going to define what is going to be the status that I will set and what is going to be considered as responded. No, so I, as I was saying before, for some webinars, I will I will use uh, responded in some cases, in other cases, other. No. And one important thing is uh, we know that uh, when we have to create this status, we have the possibility to to um, to customize them. But the problem is that they are open open text uh, fields, so that can bring a lot of uh, wrong data and a lot of uh, problems on the information. So our suggestion is to use tools like, for example, this one that is the one that we normally use, Walloper. But we know that also Cercante uh, has other tool which has a similar a similar uh, job. This is basically a tool that will help you to define uh, the status per each type of the campaign. So every time a marketer will create a campaign, the status of the different types of the campaign will be defined. And that is only, it's, it's going to save time first, but it's also going to save you from wrong reporting when you start building your reportings and you have all this type of, of status that can be, can be run. No? So, help yourself with this uh, type of tools that will help you to have uh, the right information in your reporting. And uh, tip number six, exclude no relevant campaigns from your influence, from your campaign influence. This is super important because as we were uh, talking before at the beginning, Julian was explaining that there, sometimes there are this misconception on, on the type of the campaigns that we have to compare. And if we have defined, for example, that we want to, to uh, compare the different channels that we are investing on, then use the auto association rules uh, that you have uh, in Salesforce when you are defining your campaign influence to exclude uh, the campaigns which are not relevant for your campaign influence. So I, as I was saying, for example, if I decide, uh, my team decide that we are going to compare only channels, then let's exclude all the campaigns which are conversion types, for example. So in this case, I am not going to compare, for example, organic versus the, versus demo requests, that that doesn't make any, any sense. And last, uh, because we are generous, a bonus tip, <laughs> decide the best uh, time frame for your campaign influence. Uh, this is a question that we receive uh, several times. What is the best time frame that we have to define when we set up the campaign influence. We know this is something that we can define in the auto association rules. So you can find yourself in two scenarios. You can you can be in the scenario when you don't have historical data. So you are starting the implementation of Salesforce products. So you don't have any data to work on. So I mean, our, our best suggestion in this, in this case will be to talk to your sales team to ask them what is the normal lead, lead life cycle. And based on that, start testing the different data that uh, you will get or the different reporting that you will get. The good thing of the campaign influence is that you can set, uh, you can do the setup of your auto association rules and then change it if the data is not coherent of what you're expecting. But if you do have historical data, our uh, best suggestion and uh, simple tip is to create a basic uh, formula, formula uh, 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 field in your report 
uh, a role formula in your report uh, that will be uh, 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 the opportunity create, uh, sorry, the opportunity closed date minus the date uh, when the lead was created in part of. What we will get, we will get with that is the is the average of the days that uh, it is uh, it happens uh, from the moment that the lead is created uh, in Pardot until the opportunity is won. Super important point uh, when you are doing this analysis is first uh, only consider your won opportunities because in if you are uh, using also the close opportunities you can have mixed uh, data which is not relevant for taking your decision. And the other thing is. Um, only compare uh, the opportunities which are similar in, in terms of, of the type. So, for example, don't mix uh, the analysis between renewals and new business because obviously the time frame is going to be different. So, this is going to damage your analysis and your data. So, uh, that's it. So, basically, just to summarize, uh, the six tips that we have is spend more time on planning, on talking to your stakeholders before starting. Uh, the implementation of any feature in your tool, take the decision on what is the best uh, campaign structure you you want to to set up in Salesforce, and then implement this uh, this uh, structure in Salesforce to help and to make the life easier of your marketers to create the campaigns. Then th there is many ways how we can set up uh, the auto association of the campaign members but use the tools that Salesforce uh, provide in order to auto-associate uh, the campaigns. In this way, we are going to avoid uh, the, some leads or some contacts which are not associated to the proper campaigns, and also use these tools to go beyond the trackable. No? Go, use these tools to identify the leads or the contacts which are uh, arriving to your website via organic sources and that you cannot track or you cannot use UTM to track uh, their traffic. Uh, then also uh, organize your campaign membership. Uh, this will help you on uh, the definition of your campaign influence, but also in getting the right reporting. And finally, exclude uh, no relevant campaigns from your campaign influence. And with that, of course, you ha will have a happy team, uh, a great reporting, and everybody will be aligned. Thank you very much uh, for your time, for listening to us. Uh, it's been a pleasure and a really, really nice experience to talk to you. Uh, so you have our contacts there. If you want to to uh, contact us later, perfect. Otherwise, I don't know if you we have time for questions, Christina? Yeah, we do. And we have a lot of great questions um, that came in. So I'm just going to go through a few here. Um, we have this one. What are the benefits to building a UTM tracking system in Salesforce? All right, I can take this one. Um, I mean, this is not mainly on based on UTM because UTM is uh, mostly for your Google Analytics tracking and whatever you want to see on analytics. UTM is only like a similar system you will have on tracking your parameters. So. You can, we've got some clients that use uh, UTM content, for instance, to track their, their campaign ID, which is like more like of a native stuff they've got on the URL builder. Uh, however, you can have your completely separate uh, parameter like SFC ID uh, or the one you want to track uh, with. And then it depends really on what you want to track. Uh, if it is that you want to track the channels, then it will be mostly similar to UTM. It is that you want to track conversion point, then nothing to do with it. Uh, uh, but the method will remain the same, passing the ID of the campaign in the URL and, and collecting it. Awesome. Um... We have another question here. Do you recommend using Google Analytics Pardot Connector? Hey, I mean, this is something native, so you can use it. It's fine. Be careful when you connect your campaigns to deactivate uh, the option that will automatically create campaigns from analytics. If not, it can become a mess. Uh, the thing that you need to take into account is that Google Analytics, we only take the first uh, the first uh, source and the user is coming from. So it can be an interesting information, but for me is not as complete as you will need if you want to deep dive more. Yes, especially in B2B, when you have different touch points, uh, it's necessary to take into account that if you, if you remain on, on your first uh, touch point, on your first engagement, 
the information won't be complete and you won't be able to create a really proper attribution model. So it's important. I mean, the connector, as Julian was saying, is great because it's simple to activate it. But one important thing is to try to identify, okay, how I'm going to track all the rest of my different touch points. And that, that's why uh, the advice of Julian of uh, having these systems to track the different uh, campaigns that the user is interacting with. Um, so I think those are the only questions that we have time for today, but um, the presenters obviously have provided you with contact information. Please feel free to reach out to them if you have questions, want to continue the conversation. Thank you so much for joining us for this session. Thank you to our presenters for preparing it. Um, and of course, thank you to our sponsors as well. Part Dreaming would not be possible without our sponsors. If you have some time, please go visit their booths, learn more about what they offer. Um, we have a lot of great sessions coming up for the rest of the day today. Um, one is getting started in just a little bit about using Pardot to run internal email campaigns. We hope to see you at other sessions throughout the day. And thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you all. Bye-bye.